it is dusk. This tigress is prowling through the dry scrub, stalking her prey, a hapless tear. She hides in the grass, her coat camouflaging seamlessly with the shadows around. Let us pause for a minute and look at her stripes in more detail. Did you know that the stripes of no two tigers are identical? Each is unique and can identify the tiger a bit like fingerprints? Now, how did the tiger get her stripes? The scientific answer is very simply evolution. The stripes developed over millions of years to help the animal merge with the surrounding and hence to survive. But few understood how these patterns emerged during the development of an organism. And this mystery was solved curiously enough by a mathematician, not a biologist. Welcome to a new episode of The Maths Factor where we explore the curious connection between mathematics and biology. We will wander through tiger terrain, climb evolutionary trees and track cholera outbreaks in this journey. Intrigued? Let's start off right away. The man who solved the mystery of the tiger's stripes is Alan Turing. He was a British mathematician born in 1912 and is famous for breaking the Nazi Enigma code during World War II. He played a huge role in the development of computer science. He came up with the Turing machine, which is basically the model of a general purpose computer. In 1952, Turing was prosecuted for being a homosexual. At that time, homosexual acts were illegal in the United Kingdom. Found guilty, Turing faced the prospect of going to prison. The horrific option to undergo treatment with female hormones, the equivalent of chemical castration. Faced with these two options, he picked the hormone treatment. Two years later, unable to cope with this life, he tragically killed himself. The inquest that followed determined that he had killed himself. Amid all this personal drama, he still found the time to publish a visionary paper titled The Chemical Basis of Morphogenesis on the mathematics of regularly repeating patterns in nature, like the stripes in the tigers and zebrafish, the spots in leopards and the spacing in rows of alligator teeth. Back from the drama of Turing's life, let's get back to our tiger and her stripes. When we look at skin tone, color comes as a result of melanin production. More melanin means darker skin, less melanin means lighter skin. Turing was able to figure that there were two, not one chemical at work, which is why there was no uniformity of colors. The two chemicals were an activator that produces a color and an inhibitor that blocks it. Turing proposed that the two chemicals spread throughout a system much like gas atoms in a box do, with one crucial difference. Instead of diffusing evenly, the chemicals, which Turing called morphogens, diffuse at different rates. Where's the mathematics, you may be wondering? Turing worked out a mathematical equation, partially different equation actually, that showed that when the activator and inhibitor diffuse at different rates, they can generate the exquisite variety of patterns that we see in the animal world. He used a curious analogy to explain how this works. 
Imagine an island populated only by cannibals and celibate missionaries. How will the population of these two communities multiply on the island? Let's look at the missionaries first. They're celibate, so they should die out eventually. They can also be eaten by the cannibals. However, they can convert some cannibals to become missionaries. The way it works, when two missionaries meet a cannibal, the cannibal is converted to missionary status. Now for the cannibals. They can reproduce, so their population naturally increases. In this scheme of things, the cannibals stand for the activators, while the missionaries play the role of inhibitors. On this island, we would eventually end up with a stable mix of the two. Now imagine if the missionaries are bicycles. They can now convert more cannibals to become missionaries since they move around. Their focus is on far reaches of the island, which then become saturated with missionaries. In other areas, cannibals increase their numbers as their families grow through procreation. The rate of reaction, which is the conversion of cannibals to missionaries, and the diffusion, which is how quickly the cannibals and missionaries are moving, determines the eventual pattern. The beauty of this explanation is that it also tells us why no two tigers have the same stripes and why the pattern in a tiger changes as it grows older. These are living patterns produced by non-stop interaction between the activator and inhibitor molecules. And this works across the animal world, from the patterns on a giraffe and deer to even shades of color on a mouse. Now, when Turing published this theory, it was considered intriguing but speculative. Curiously enough, it was in 2012, in a centenary year, that this theory was verified experimentally. This was through an experiment in King's College, London, on mice. The researchers were studying the rigid patterns on the roof of the mouth in mice, and they managed to actually identify the pair of morphogens working together to influence where each ridge will be formed. It was the first time that biologists were able to prove and observe the direct implications of this 60-year-old theory. Let's move away from the tiger and its tribes to Darwin. At the heart of Darwin's theory of evolution lies a beautifully simple mathematical object, the evolutionary tree. Now, we're going to look at a group of animals and see how maths is used to reconstruct and understand the evolutionary tree. Let's take four species from the cat family. A domestic cat, a leopard, a tiger and a cheetah. Now let's add one obvious outlier to this group, a snail. Now let's pick a series of characteristics to compare them. Let's go with size whiskers, spots, and whether they purr. If we compare spots assigning for a 1 for yes and 0 for no, this is what we'll get. Similarly, when we compare on whiskers, purring, and size. Based on this, we work out the distance between any two species. For example, cat and tiger agree on whiskers, spots, and purr, but not in size. So the distance between them is three. Similarly, cat and cheetah, leopard and tiger, and leopard and cheetah all have a distance of three. Since it is a small amount of data, let us tabulate all possible closeness. Now that we have sorted our data, the big question is how to infer the correct evolutionary tree from this data. The closest any two species get is three and that is for all four types of feli. So we guess that the cats are more closely related. This places the snail at the bottom of the tree. Next, the cat is closely related to the tiger and cheetah with a closeness of three, but less to the leopard, closeness of two. So these three are at the top of the tree. So we make the cheetah the first species to branch away among cat, leopard and tiger. The first two are closer to cheetah so we make the tiger branch before the other two do. At this point, there are two different ways to complete the tree. Either cat or leopard, both branching from the line leading to cheetah and then split, or cheetah and cat branch from leopard. In the first picture, the cat is closer to the leopard than to the cheetah. 
but actually it's closer to the cheetah than to leopard, so we plump for the second tree. However, if we made comparisons in a different order or with different characteristics, we may have a different tree. So we also need to measure how well the overall tree fits the data. Then we look at variations like swapping leopard and tiger and see whether we do better. Now the curious fact that emerges after all these efforts is that many such trees are possible. We can use the mathematical methods of optimization to fit the best tree to the data. And this can help us determine the evolutionary journey of animals. We are now going to move from plotting evolutionary trees to plotting animal behavior. Let's first meet up with some vervet monkeys. When a predator is close, the vervet monkeys give an alarm call to warn fellow monkeys. Even though in doing so, they attract attention to themselves, increasing their personal chance of being attacked. Now, why would they do this? Isn't altruism detrimental to their chances of survival? To understand this behavior, we need to use game theory. What is a game? Where animals are concerned. It is the interaction between individuals vying for a share of limited resources. Every game has a risk and a payoff and the mathematical balance between the two is what we are exploring. Back to our monkeys. Doesn't it make sense that natural selection would favor monkeys that do not give alarm calls over those that do? Game theory helps us reach the conclusion that a group that contains a high proportion of alarm calling monkeys will have a survival advantage over a group containing a lower proportion, thereby encouraging this trait to continue and evolve among individuals. Monkeys are not the only animals to have figured this out. Take a vampire, some regurgitate blood and donate it to other members of their group who have failed to feed that night ensuring that they do not starve. In numerous bird species, a breeding pair receives help in raising its young from other helper birds who protect the nest from predators and help to feed the fledglings. In social insect colonies, ants, wasps, bees and termites, sterile workers devote their whole lives caring for the queen, constructing the nest foraging for food and looking after their larvae. Such behavior is truly altruistic. Sterile workers obviously do not leave any offspring of their own, but their actions greatly assist the reproductive efforts of the queen. Quite fascinating, isn't it? On the Maths Factor, we are exploring the deeply entangled threads between mathematics and biology. Our journey now takes us to the city of London in 1853. We will head to Soho, which was at that time reeling under the impact of a cholera outbreak. 10% of the population had been wiped out. Authorities believed that the disease was spreading like a miasma or bad air emanating from stinky sewers. Dr. John Snow, an anesthetist, was skeptical. He decided to use mathematics to prove that this theory was not true. He started off by talking to local residents. He identified the source of the outbreak as the public water pump on Broad Street. However, there were other pumps nearby. How could he show that it was this particular pump that was the source? So he made a map. He marked the locations of the homes of everyone who had died. Each bar on this graph represents a death at that address. Some are taller, showing the number of deaths. Some homes had as many as 18. This representation of data shows that most of the deaths were tightly clustered in a specific area, crowded around the water pump. His next ingenious step was to represent the time it took to travel to the Broad Street pump on his map and to calculate who was most likely to use water pump in the area. Snow drew a curve on the map that marked the points where Broad Street pump was at equal walking distance from other neighboring water pumps. If you live inside this curve, the Broad Street pump is your nearest source of water. 
almost all the deaths marked in the map lay inside this curve. Now, this mapping that Snow did is actually an example of a brilliant mathematical device called a Voronoi diagram. Starting off with a set of points, then construct a series of cells surrounding each point. Now, each cell contains all points that are closer to its defining point than to any other point in the set. So, the borders of the cells are equidistant between the defining points of adjacent cells. So, if we study Snow's diagram, the points are the pumps and the cells around them indicate the distance to the nearest pump. Snow used this mathematical analysis to convince the authorities that his theory that the disease was transmitted through water was correct. In fact, the London authorities made an effort to provide clean water to the community after this historic breakthrough. After Snow set the precedent, the use of mathematics to understand disease has saved millions of lives. To understand the significance, we must remember that it took another 30 years before the exact cause of the disease, the cholera bacterium, was actually identified. Going forward, some of the great breakthroughs in medicine, such as understanding the link between malaria and mosquitoes, were discovered using mathematical models of the spread of the disease. Let's move to the heart. A scientist called William Harvey in the 17th century used simple arithmetic to understand the working of our heart. What was the prevalent theory then on how the heart works? For that we need to rewind to the 2nd century CE to meet Galen, a famous physician. One of his beliefs was that the body continuously created blood. This did not sound right to William Harvey. How could he challenge this? By a method known as contradiction. He presumed that this theory was true and showed the end result was impossible. Let's see how that works. His observations of dissected hearts showed that the passage of blood through the heart is unidirectional due to one-way valves in arteries and veins. He observed that in most animals and humans as well, the heart pumps 4 grams per beat and it beats 1000 times per half an hour. And there are 48 hours in a day. So the total quantity of blood pumped per day exceeds 1000 into 48 into 4 grams which is equal to 192 kg. But this is absurd. This amount far exceeded the amount that the body could possibly make. So Gallen's theory must not be true. Harvey managed to show that the heart must be pumping the same blood over and over again with the one-way valves ensuring blood flow in closed circuit. From the heart of the 17th century London, let's jump to a hospital in the 21st century to see how mathematics can be used in medicine today. The patient here is undergoing an MRI, which is the short form for magnetic resonance imaging. It's a procedure used in hospitals to scan patients and determine the severity of certain injuries. An MRI uses a magnetic field and radio waves to create detailed images of the body. So where is mathematics then? This brings us to a very interesting area of mathematics known as tomography, which is the art of figuring out what's inside the body by probing it from the outside. This is not just used in MRIs, but also in a huge range of medical technologies like CAT and PET. Now, computers transform these vast streams of raw data into vivid images. But if computers are the eye off, then mathematics is certainly the brain of medical imaging. Let's take a simple analogy to see how it works. Imagine that milk and fruit juice in your office is delivered in bottles that are placed in trays with nine compartments arranged as a three into three grid. Each compartment of the tray contains a bottle which may contain milk, juice or be empty. Looking from the top, we cannot make out which bottle is of which kind. However, different types of bottles absorb different amounts of light. Measurements indicate that milk bottles absorb 3 units, 
juice bottles two units and empty bottles one unit. This table indicates the amount of light absorbed when light shines through each of the rows and each of the columns. So the sum of absorptions in the first row adds up to 5, to 5 in the second row and so on. Consider the middle column. It contains 3 bottles and also absorbs 3 units of light. The only way this can be done is for each compartment of the middle column to contain one empty bottle absorbing one unit of light. This is a bit like a Sudoku, isn't it? What about the other compartments? Unfortunately, we don't have enough information yet to solve this puzzle. Here are two possible solutions. We need a little more information. One obvious extra thing we can measure is the light absorbed in the two diagonals of the tray. We do this and find that six units are absorbed in this diagonal and three units in the other. From this information, it is clear that the first solution, not the second, is the right one. Now the same idea is used to create MRIs. Very simply what happens is that an actual image can be pieced together by measuring the intensity of the emerging beams and magnetic fields, a bit like a Sudoku. But in reality, we use complicated mathematical algorithms. These algorithms contain step-by-step -step instructions that tell a computer how to reconstruct a person's insides from an incoherent mush of scanner data. It's a bit like a police sketch artist, combining information gathered from many view into a single portrait. Well, that's all we have time for today. We have seen how mathematics and biology are connected. Increasingly, mathematical know-how will be used to transform biology into a predictive theoretical science. Well, that's all from us today. Keep watching The Maths Factor for more fun learning.